good morning. We're going to start our press conference based on the results of the uh, national polling or questionnaire by the uh, Democratic Initiative Foundation. Uh, topics which are related to Donbass area, which are absolutely topical in their constantly in the focus of attention of the sociologists, political scientists. That's why we can talk about certain dynamics and just follow up the uh, transformation of the um, public mentality of the ideas in Ukraine, or on the contrary, if there are no transformation changes to that matter. Very briefly, I'm going to, talk, to tell you about the results of our polling. We are very interesting participants in our discussion, they are going to speak up their mind. Specifically, we are talking about the fact that this fall, they, um, they expect to uh, witness the uh, drawing up of the special um, uh, law related to the occupied territories, and I believe that the knowledge of the public opinion is of critical importance in order to adopt well-weighted and uh, well-balanced decisions. For a person who has been uh, studying such an idea of more than 30 um, uh, years, I don't believe that this uh, August Papu's uh, idea, but we have to actually to, to, to take into consideration the public opinion, by the way, inside this country, and also I'm talking about the international experts who we have been discussing these, those um, uh, topics for repeatedly, you know, we try to demonstrate what we have, what public opinion we have in Ukraine, and I believe this also um, affected um, the uh, train of thoughts of our partners. Uh, if, I mean, the deformation of those, those such ideas which uh, would correspond to the realities we are living with. Speaking about uh, the results which we uh, obtained, first off, when we uh, ask the citizens whether the compromises are required, if you are talking about the resolution of the problems related to Donbass, then yes. Our citizens, the overwhelming majority, um, uh, it is percent of the population believe that yes, we need those compromises. But when we ask what kind of compromises, are they prepared to pay any kind of price for the peace? Then uh, only 17% they would like to accept any kind of the decisions or resolutions in order to ensure peace. Because not all the compromises are acceptable for our citizens. In other polling, we asked what kind of compromises the year prepared for, and it uh, turned out that many of those compromises, which are actually included in the Minsk agreements, are not acceptable. For example, we are talking about the um, elections, yes, but when we are talking about the special terms and conditions for those elections, they answered that they have to be based on the laws and legislation in Ukraine, and only when Ukraine will establish its full or complete control over its uh, frontiers and borders, and the elections can come only after the disarmament of the rebels and the militants, that uh, we can uh, say that we are talking about different kind of elections which ha can be meant by Russia, for example. Only 18% of the citizens are prepared to uh, establish peace in the Donbass area through the uh, using of force. This is very indicative as well, and which is interesting. This is, again, another tendency. The more, uh, the farther from the uh, front line, the higher is the uh, militant um, uh, aspirations or um, uh, sentiments. The more people are prepared for more peaceful, uh, I would say, um, uh, uh, actions. Then the question what is considered by our people for most uh, efficient for establishing peace in Donbass. For um, uh, a long time now, they are talking about the increasing the pressure on Russia for them to renounce their, no, don't just renounce, to say no to their interference in Donbass. And the second answer, the um, restoration of normal life in the temporary occupied territory of Donbass. Those are the stable or the existing uh, answers which have been exist in existence for two years at least now. First of all, that not only Ukraine, Ukraine can exert the, uh, you know, the um, decisive influence, but uh, whatever can be done by Ukraine, it should be done. As compared to the previous years, the number of those persons decreased who believe that uh, we have to stop financing those territories to achieve peace. Uh, there were tw uh, 20 last years, now 18. So 
And uh, today, such people who believe that this will be uh, sufficient, only 5% recommend of those people. Same can be said about those who believe that the federal uh, let's say status can save the situation. Again, only 5% of the those polled believe this. So first of all, they would like Russia to to stop their interference. The Ukraine has to successfully restore the territories which are under control of the government of Ukraine. As for the um, decision to you know, the, uh, let's say the, uh, the, the the National Security and Defense Council to stop the data block, the um, economic relations, so quite a few are for that decision, but 37% are against that. And here uh, we are talking about regional differences. The highest support for the blockage uh, blocking is in the west, uh, in the lowest, 38% uh, in the east. As for the proposal to, um, to recognize the, uh, the, the, the parts of the, the Denis Lugansk region as temporarily occupied, 55% the majority is for, against only 22%, but and uh, one fourth of the population. Uh, we uh, found it difficult to answer these questions. They were not um, uh, actually decided what to what. Again, they support 64% in the West and the center. Uh, for this, the uh, fewest number numbers 49 in the East and 35%, uh, the lowest number, in the South. So we asked what, was, what about the uh, political future of those those occupied territories of the so-called LPR and DPR. The number of those increase who do not want to to give to those territories or at least some of the autonomy, 56% of the Ukrainians would like to restore the pre-war uh, situation in the statute of the regions. Every fifth uh, respondent, uh, they gravitate to give more autonomy to those regions, but uh, as part of Ukraine, and 9% in this country supported the independent existence, let's say, or um, now those territories the way it is now, or as part of the Russian Federation. But generally speaking, as compared to the previous years, the support of those proposed to give more rights uh, to those uncontrolled territories has decreased even more. Uh, to give uh, the known rights of the territories of the so-called DPR and um, PR are in the east, and again we are talking about only 28 percent, less than one third. The majority wish those territories to be uh, to remain part uh, of Ukraine in the pre-war status. For some reason, the people are very fear any kind of autonomies or independences, you know, including the territories where we actually question, let's say not question, but we report the population in the Donetsk and Lugansk areas controlled by the government of Ukraine. Again, if you're talking about the peacemaking contingent, uh, you now and they force that is 60%, only uh, 20% are against. The only region uh, where the number of the of those who are against peacemaking contingent is the South. 56% uh, against 36% for this. Of late, uh, we saw the tendency when the South becomes, generally speaking, kind of the uh, region of concern. Um, let's say uh, even more, uh, it, it actually uh, demonstrates more concern, or let's say requires more concern than the Donetsk or Lugansk region in the eastern Ukraine. We have to talk about the big number of respondents who did not specify their minds regarding the, um, the, 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 the um, uh, peacemaking contingent. 28 percent, but in the, in the south, uh, 25. Speaking about those which are in control territories in Donetsk and Lugansk territories, there are a lot of different proposals. Again, uh, like uh, one year back, we do not have kind of um, obviously, uh, obviously, let's say, uh, bigger number of the people, opinion of the people, 23 percent of the population support the complete isolation of so-called DPR and LPR. 22% believe that it would be expedient to continue economic block, block blocking, but to, uh, to 
to preserve the humanitarian um, uh, relationship. Uh, then uh, another portion of the population believe that it should be given preference to some critical uh, commodities. And the maximum support of the humanitarian support, 15% for the maximum uh, development of the uh, ties with the uncontrolled territories, both humanitarian and the commercial ones or trading ones. So you can see different pictures if you're talking about different proposals. Each of those proposals has its champions and there is no one overwhelming position or opinion. It is obvious that maybe the, when the government takes some specific uh, stance or position, they will have to come up with some kind of the uh, awareness campaign to explain why it is so and not in a different way. The population has different attitude to the humanitarian and social policy. It should be noted that the population of all the regions support first and foremost uh, simplification of access to education in the Ukrainian, higher educational establishments for the uncontrolled territories residents. And given those residents, those who would like to leave the uncontrolled territories to the control by government territories, give them more rights and increase the control of the payments to the uh, IDPs in order to avoid abuse, um, a lot of criticism uh, for that. More serious control over the crossing the, uh, the front line. And facilitation of given any kind of administrative services in the front line uh, populated areas and given permit to trade in uh, foodstuffs in the uh, first requirement basket of the commodities. We can see that they are, people are humane in their attitude regarding the humanitarian ties and links with those territories. However, what this population is against, um, the limitations for the social and pension payments to the citizens of Ukraine residing in the uncontrolled uh, territories. And this was regarding the facilitation of crisis in the front line, uh, different. Uh, 38% they support the simplification, 40% now. And there is a very clear regional division, and they support this kind of simplification of the cross and front line areas in the um, east and the south, a negative attitude in the center of Ukraine, in the west, western parts of Ukraine. Those are the general results, I believe, and those give us the um, uh, grounds for some of the uh, thoughts, or food for uh, thoughts. First of all, I would like to give the floor to our experts, so please be brief in your uh, in your opinions maybe you start experts say that we have to start with the deputy minister you have the floor and they are going to provide their comments well my idea was uh, on, uh, i mean the different one okay good uh, good afternoon first of all i would like to thank irena as always for a wonderful material uh, I always uh, read such surveys with uh, big respect and uh, satisfaction. I understand that for us, for the representatives of the authorities who are developing all these issues, it is important to understand what's happening in the society. From my point of view, and Irina has mentioned that, the only thing I see that unites all the regions is for seven to enhance the control on uh, uh, paying to IDPs. Um, that is uh, um, to enhance control over paying uh, money to IDPs to avoid uh, abuse. That is the only issue that unites all the regions. The second one, humanitarian, you mentioned, it's on providing certain uh, capacities uh, for children uh, from non-controlled territories uh, in order to get uh, a higher education, and this is the issue that has been uh, resolved by our ministry. Now the exams are going on, and it will be interesting to see the results. In some 
issues. I didn't have a chance to analyze uh, all that in detail, but I have the impression, and that is again what Irina uh, mentioned. I've mentioned, I've recollected even uh, the um, one of the jokes of the Soviet times. Uh, the more we look uh, to the east, uh, the more military moods we see. But I can tell you from my own experience, most of people who are sort of supporters of the military way of uh, resolving the issues, most of them have never been to the east. And uh, uh, the zero for them is just a mathematical figure. I need to state that, again, we have the confirmation that regions differ greatly from one from another. And that means that the issue of peace and war, the issue of price of peace, uh, is uh, uh, perceived uh, differently in different parts of Ukraine. And as a civil servant and as a person, I am happy that a small percentage of people who believe, there's a small percentage of people who believe that uh, the way to uh, resolve the um, issue of military tension in the East uh, is uh, to uh, uh, reject from uh, accession to NATO. That's what uh, uh, I like, because I believe that uh, this is uh, uh, where we might have many supporters. I'm happy that this is not so. Uh, again, I made, uh, it's not a discovery, but uh, once again, I realized that we need to, to do more to explain to people all these ideas to the all these ideas in professional way. If you go um, and ask people, ninety nine percent of people will not be able to explain what's the difference between occupation and annexation. Maybe 85% of our citizens, even among those who are for recognizing the territories as occupied, they do not know what, are, what could be the consequences. They don't understand why this shouldn't be done. And uh, from my point of view, the population is not well informed about these things. We need to explain much more. Unfortunately, we can, the interpreters cannot hear the comments which are made without the microphone. If uh, Mr. Garan thinks differently, you can, you can say. Okay, Alexei Matsuka the head of the uh, public TV broadcasting of Donbass, public television on Donbass. I would like to tell you that uh, two weeks ago in the Donetsk region in Svetogirsk we had Donbass Media Forum, 200 data journalists were there and uh, you could see that uh, all the, that is mentioned in our press release uh, that has been also offered for discussion at this forum. But we, as the organizers of Donbass Media Forum, we saw that uh, all the issues which are related to non-control part of Donbass, they are become uh, the... Um, issues for political populism which uh, inter gets into the media 
discussions, uh, the journalists, uh, for example, uh, themselves uh, uh, talking about whether we are building the wall, whether we have many people who were supporting the uh, opposite side. And uh, we that is why we initiated to have this Donbass Media Forum to understand where and to show where there's uh, journalism, where's professionalism, where are personal emotions or the trauma of a journalist uh, and was objective view. And I would like to mention that during the forum we presented uh, the survey. It's very brief, but very demonstrative. And it's about use of uh, the language of um, uh, Mm. of um, talking about enemies. Four uh, publications were analyzed, and the main conclusion was that inside the non-controlled territory, there is a negative opinion about Ukrainian formed. On Ukrainian part of Donetsk region, we've discovered only 2% of such information were quotations were indicating at uh, uh, something negative. And that's, uh, you can see that more on the website of the Donetsk Institute of Information. But I agree with what um, Mrs. Bikeshkina said, that the further we are from the front line, the more aggressive become bloggers, com those who put comments in social networks. And we see very negative words uh, used uh, in relation to the citizens of non-controlled uh, territories. And these words uh, are used in writing blogs mostly by some popular bloggers who have uh, many subscribers, and that also forms uh, the public opinion as to perceive how the mm, non-controlled territory of the Nisk and Gansk regions are perceived. Uh, and so using this opportunity, I would like to invite the journalists and activists for discussion, because unfortunately, in Ukraine, there's no initiated by the state discussion on the issue of non-controlled territory of Donbass, there is the so-called Council on National Unity, and they met together last time in summer a year ago, and nothing happened after that. And there's no platform for the dialogue on the relations between the citizens of Ukrainian part of Donbass and non-controlled part of Donbass. There's no such a platform, and the media, like our public television of Donbass and news of Donbass, they become the platform for uh, starting this dialogue. But uh, And I believe that national media will join this uh, Ukrainian dialogue on peaceful settlement of the situation. Thank you. Now I'd like to give the floor to Petro Burkovsky, the head of the Department of the Development of Political Systems, uh, National Institute for Strategy uh, Research. Um, the, foreign, uh, econo the foreign political aspect, that's what I would like to mention. Talking about foreign political aspect, you uh, correctly mentioned that the public opinion not just for Ukrainian politicians, but for our foreign partners who are trying to help peaceful process is important. Now, when we see the results of the survey here, we have the representative of one of the countries of G7, and I would like to mention three issues which are important. 
for helping peaceful process. 52% of Ukrainians agreed to compromise, but not for all com for any compromise. 55% want the occupied territories to uh, return to Ukraine, and 60% say that they are ready. Contingent. To uh, they agree to uh, getting the peaceful forces. What is the message? Uh, Minsk agreements cannot be the basis for continuing dialogue between Ukraine and Russia in Normandy uh, uh, format or even at the level of the UN. The people will not support such decisions and that threatens by uh, internal uh, conflict in Ukraine. And we need to find out some other solutions which will be supported, because only then we'll have the guarantee that the peace could be established. Uh, but we saw that temporary solutions were imposed, and in conflicts in Europe and conflicts in the Middle East, they didn't take into account the opinion, uh, the public opinion, and the, in the result, these are uh, the conflicts which are frozen, but from time to time they become hot. So that's the message for our foreign political partners. As regards the internal uh, policy, and there is a very interesting question. There is a difference between different regions. However. I really like two questions which were contained in the October questionnaire of uh, the initiative last year when they asked how many citizens, generally speaking, have relatives or the acquaintances residing in the occupied territories and how many citizens uh, have uh, their relatives or acquaintances who participate in the combat activities. If I'm not mistaken, there were 23 or 24 percent, the number one figure, another figure, those uh, who actually heard or they know for sure that they participated in armed conflict. As Mr. Tuka said, that uh, not from the TV screen, they know that there is zero, but the people told them that these uh, figures were close to the zero. Um, well, you, uh, but uh, they didn't know the, the real situation. So it would be very interesting to know how such people uh, respond to the proposals of peace and what is their vision of the resolution of this conflict and what they support. And here are the rest of interesting things in my mind, in my opinion. And the um, Western regions and the Eastern regions, the citizens uh, say uh, they, I believe their opinion will be very close. And this could become one of the channels to form, I would put it this way, of the realistic perception of the conflict in the, among the majority of the population. That's it. Thank you. Now I'm going to give the floor to Alexei Melnik, expert of the Rosenkov Center. Alexei, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Irina also would like to emphasize that uh, the Rosenkov Center participated in the uh, sociological polling and uh, poll, uh, and uh, I am responsible for its presentation of the results of this poll. But I believe that your introductory part was rather exhaustive if you are talking about the informative part of that. But I would like to speak up some of the um, opinions regarding uh, the issues you are uh, discussed here. Number one, uh, if you are talking about the, uh, um, the settlement of the conflict, sometimes they, they regard this in a rather simple way, uh, just speaking about uh, some extreme ways to settle, either a victory or capitulation. Or um, uh, let's say, uh, but the real life the, uh, shows that this kind of settlement is somewhere in between those two extremes. And we are talking about the, um, the kind of compromise you mentioned a few minutes ago. We have some uh, information regarding how Ukrainian citizens uh, value the uh, border or boundary of this compromise. Uh, number two, speaking about the conflict settlement. 
proceeding as we uh, like to refer to some ex uh, international experience. So proceeding from the international experience, for example, the Br British strategy of combating the rebels or insurgents, there are certain key uh, provisions uh, which are the result of the many year uh, fighting against insurgents or rebels. And one of the prerequisites of this conflict settlement is that the government, which is going to take under its control those territories, they have to offer to the population residing in those territories something more than uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, government, either the government of the separatists or the occupationists. And here we have, I believe, uh, big problems. Uh, number two, again, uh, proceeding from the international experience, the main thing is not so much uh, fight for the territory, or this kind of fight can become uh, futile if you fail to win the hearts and souls of the people. And the sociology can be instrumental here. We, if we do not understand the minds of the people who live in those territories or nearby, we have to understand what they think and what expectations or inspiration they have. And uh, here, uh, most critical, if we are talking about this kind of fight for the, uh, the minds and the hearts of the people, is the uh, fight for the people who, who somebody tries to tell them uh, or to promise them. I would like to base my, um, uh, to, to tell you the, um, the results of one of, uh, another study uh, carried out by the uh, Roscom Center, the security issues, but they are really relevant to our topic where, which we um, discuss today. What we can see here, all the um, authorities of Ukraine to this or another extent, they have a very low uh, level of trust among the uh, citizens of Ukraine. Also, we paid attention, uh, and the, the attention was riveted by, uh, my, my, by the previous speakers, there are significant regional uh, differences. If we talk about the president at the head of the state, the balance of trust or confidence is negative, generally speaking, in Ukraine. We are talking about something close to 50%. In the east of Ukraine, this level of uh, lack of uh, confidence is 1% higher. So generally, if uh, in Ukraine they do not trust uh, the president, in the east of Ukraine they, they trust him even less. Uh, I mean, the president of Ukraine, even more concerned are the regional differences of confidence or lack of confidence or trust to our uh, law enforcement bodies. We, we often repeat that the armed um, forces of the National Guards are one of the few of the state authorities which have positive balance of confidence among the citizens of Ukraine. So I'd like to say that if a general in Ukraine, um, so this kind of level of confidence to the armed forces about uh, 20% positive, then in the east of Ukraine is minus 10 percent, mean, mean negative balance. The same relates to the National Guards. So it's a big question whether this is because of the Russian propaganda or do we have to talk about the practical experience of the citizens residing, residing in the east of Ukraine. I would like to echo uh, which Mr. Tuka mentioned regarding the requirement of the strategic integration and the um, uh, and yeah, the awareness of the citizens. I would like to add to what has been said that uh, this is also very important, but it's also important that our uh, authorities be rather professional and honest, integral in their declarations. To give an example, I do not agree with you when you say that those territories cannot be called occupied. Like we cannot say the occupied territories, the, uh, the territory of the uh, illegally annexed uh, Crimea and our Authorities very, uh, very often manipulate, I'm not talking about you personally, they very often manip manipulate with the fact that citizens are not really experts on what is normal, which is, well, is no abnormal because this is international law and the Ukrainian instruments and documents, and we have to follow the letter of the law if we would like to differ in, to some extent from those who we fight against. Uh, in the end, I would like to say to, to say a few words about the peacemaking force or the change of the format of the peacemakers who are uh, there today. The uh, OSCE 
uh, mission which is unarmed today, uh, they will not do anything in terms of security or the efficiency if they were provided with the arms. This will be detrimental to their mission. Next point is the mission of the United Nations. Um, I can tell you not only from the theoretical knowledge, uh, but uh, this person who has practical experience of participating in the peacemaking operation, that uh, the development of such a mission is rather problematic. At the same time, does it mean that we should not, um, uh, let's say, um, and try to, 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 to defend this idea in the international organizations. But we have to understand that the prospects for development of the UN mission, peacemaking mission in Ukraine is almost unrealistic today. Also, we have to understand in that uh, when uh, they say well, the God would like to punish people, he just implements their wishes. So if you are going to defend the uh, peacemaking mission ideas, certain point of time we can have this situation, by the way, we already had such a situation about a year back when there were some kind of uncertain results of the future relationship uh, between the uh, uh, with the United States of America, that this idea of uh, development of the um, peacemaking mission can be supported in the way which we almost do not consider today. I'm talking about the um, peacemaking forces of the Russian Federation of, of the CIS, and uh, the tanks with such symbols and the helmets were noticed already back in 2014. So this idea of the peacemaking. Uh, mission is very attractive, but we have to understand also the risks related to such an idea and what kind of terms and conditions which can make it possible. I mean, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Alexei Garani. Alexei, you have the floor. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to start with kind of the te technical methodological aspect uh, for the journals. When you are going to analyze and quote the results of this study of this uh, polling. So please correlate the results of different questions because depending how the question is formulated, we can obtain different results uh, in the form of the uh, responses or answers. For example, they mentioned that the number of the persons who believe that to establish peace, we have to stop finance or fund those territories. So this number decreased to 12%. But if we take uh, this question, uh, look at this question, it's number six. What decisions should be taken to establish peace in the Donbass area. So people really believe that this is not uh, a key important issue to establish peace in the Donbass area. That's why we have such a, a, a low figure. When they ask a question uh, specifically whether we should uh, withdraw the restrictions regarding the payments to the citizens residing in, in their uncontrolled territories, this uh, number four question. Uh, then we have 42% who say no. So the majority of the people do not want to restrict, uh, to, to, to decrease those restrictions. We can uh, discuss whether this is correct or not, but the public opinion in its majority, in their majority, do not support the limitation of the of, um, Excuse me. They support the limitation of funding of those citizens who remain to reside on the occupied territories. Now, uh, as regards uh, some other questions, uh, which actually raised very important discussion, the issue of, um, the, of blocking, on blockade. Uh, we can see uh, the, uh, the overwhelming majority of the population, they believe that 47% they believe it's correct. 37, um, I mean, mostly do not support that or do not support. So the situation is in the East, I mean, the situation is different. But if you're talking about the blockade or the blocking, the public opinion gravitates to in favor of this blocking. What Mr. Tuka mentioned regarding the recognition of those uncontrolled territories as occupied ones, the question number three, you can say that the public opinion believe that yes, we have to consider them as occupied territories. And I agree here with the arguments given by my, uh, by another Alexei, 
in those who sit between two elections, as we say, you can make your wish, you know. Uh, and I believe that this decision uh, meets uh, or corresponds, a potential decision, because it hasn't been passed yet. It corresponds to the general sentiment. So people in Ukraine, majority of them, believe that those territories must be called what uh, called spade is spade, that's temporarily occupied territories. In this case, this public opinion is rather a powerful uh, factor uh, playing into the hands of the government and the authorities, and they have to take that into consideration. You can see here that, um, I, well, the most interesting for me in this polling is uh, how the uh, East responds to those questions, or the South of Ukraine, and we can see here that even in the east of Ukraine, the overwhelming majority also support recognition of those territories as temporarily occupied ones. In the south, the, the, this number is somewhat smaller, which is very interesting. You really mentioned that we can see that in the south, the level of radicalism is lower, and the preparedness for compromise is uh, sometimes higher than in the east of Ukraine. Now on the issue six, regional uh, distribution. Uh, Alexei started talking about the limits of compromise, that we need to agree to some compromise. For me, this is still uh, something which uh, is not defined. We need to agree to compromise, but the question is which compromise. If you analyze item six, which uh, solution is to be approved so that we have peace in Donbass, and if you look at the regional or national um, the results, you will see whatever is in Minsk agreement, uh, and uh, providing the special status f federalization of uh, Ukraine, uh, giving Ukrainian language the status of the second state language to refuse from membership in NATO. It does not take, it is not supported even in the south and the east. It's not not supported, but they don't believe that this will be important for establishing peace. They understand that this is not the root of the uh, problem, and we need to take that into account when we think about what could... be the compromise. Seven, political future of the territories. Here we again see that the South, 52% say that the territory should uh, stay in Ukraine at the same uh, conditions as before, 47 against. There are a quarter of uh, uh, voters uh, believe that they need to be part of Ukraine, but to have more independence from Kiev. If we uh, implement decentralization, then uh, this could be the basis for a uh, possible compromise. But again, most of the voters of the citizens in all the regions believe that uh, they need to stay at the same terms. Uh, then on uh, international peaceful uh, peace uh, uh, keeping forces, but the question is, who could be in these peacekeeping forces if this will be Russia or CIS? Yes, that's not what we need. But now our foreign partners are saying something that they have not been talking about before. The Ukrainian thesis is that in Minsk agreements, the Minsk agreements say that the control of Ukraine abroad will be restored in the end, and that's not for us, uh, but Ukrainian diplomacy is promoting the thesis, okay, let it be the control of OSCE abroad. 
And for me, it's important that the West started talking about that. And Tillerson mentioned that in Kiev. We need to talk about the control over the border and then move to it resolving the political issues. So in the whole, I would like to say that first security and then political solutions, that is what is now supported by our Western partners. There are some dangers, uh, some threats there, because that's mentioned uh, publicly. We don't know what will be discussed, but at least there is such a change in Western position registered. Thank you. Before we switch to questions, I would like to make several announcements. First, you probably saw that we, in our regional uh, distribution, we don't have Donbass uh, as a separate uh, region. Uh, we saw, we did it uh, in the past, but we saw that there are different differences in public opinion. When it's national um, survey, and uh, about 100 persons uh, are repre representing Donbass, and we cannot uh, do it when the number of people is 100. So we uh, are now are talking about eastern region, but it is important to know the position of these uh, regions, Donetsk and Lugansk. So now we are... Uh, working on a survey in Donetsk and Lugansk regions, uh, we will then be able to talk more specifically about the opinion of the citizens of that region, of these regions. Now we are uh, talking to people who work in these regions, to experts, and very soon we'll organize the press conference on that. Alexei mentioned decentralization. On Thursday, we'll have a press conference on the national survey on the questionnaire on decentralization and the position of the Eastern region is very interesting, and we'll talk about that somewhat later. Now, if you have any questions, you're welcome. We have some time left. As to the discussion on providing not some special status, but the status of temporary occupied territories. And the discussions are going on about that. Do the experts believe, the civil servants and others believe that it's worth to analyze all the events Uh, on the temporary occupied territory of Crimea. Just recollect when the law of Ukraine was approved. How was the first UN resolution uh, worded? And that was in March 2014. There was a pause. Uh, that uh, when all the leading, now there was a big pause after that, and now all the leading international organizations recognized the, the fact of occupation. And Mr. Tuka mentioned it correctly. People do not always understand what it means and what are the consequences. In the recent uh, submission to the International Court of the UN, they are now talking about specific articles of Geneva Convention of 1949. And if we look at the non-controlled territories of the East, I believe we can make very interesting conclusions. 
just remember the siege of blockade of Crimea. For a year, the West was talking about Ukraine violating the human rights, but the blockade is not stopped. It's now at the state level. Do we hear such uh, accusations now? The occupied territory is recognized as the occupied territory and the occupying and the state occupant is responsible for that and there are many articles which could be also uh, very important for the Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Thank you for your question. I believe that the discussion that you have mentioned is uh, the discussion which requires non-public discussion of uh, international lawyers, experts, but not the journalists, not the civil activists who know nothing about international law, and they give just emotional assessments, uh, and uh, they call the, uh, and because they call the events in the East uh, the war, uh, nothing is changed. Uh, when I call these territories, the territories occupied by Russia, this does not influence the opinion of the judiciary in the West. Uh, and I am against uh, such thing as when we uh, put uh, our personal understanding of the idea into international documents. I agree that the professional discussion should be held, but this does not make, that this does not mean that we shouldn't be doing a lot of uh, education. We need to organize the awareness campaign so that uh, the society understands what it means, what could be the consequences. Thank you. Other questions? Espresso TV channel. Mrs. Bikeshina said that the authorities uh, choose uh, the strategy, then you need to uh, explain why. And to Mr. Tuka, on Wednesday, mass media published the text of the draft law on reintegration of Western territories. Is that the real text? Isn't that the fake? Because if it is a fake, then the next question will have no sense. I gave answer to this question. If the first time after public uh, uh, speech uh, of the secretary of the Security and Defense Council, I was uh, then there and I had the draft and I was ready to provide comments on it. The document, which is now in mass media, I saw only the first page of it. Second, it doesn't have any status. It's neither the draft law. I cannot understand even what it is. I assume that there might be uh, many, many of such documents. Is it worth paying attention to something that we don't know what it is? I don't want to, to do it. When this document is submitted to the Verkhovna Rada as an official draft law, then we can discuss it. But now uh, it's... Uh, no sense discussing something that we don't know what it is. I can tell you that it differs from a real document which I uh, saw in the uh, Defense and Co Security Council. I would like to add, me as a journalist, I was surprised 
that the Council of Defense and Security or Presidential Administration put something for the discussion of the public, and there's no discussion about that. Uh, the um, destiny of seven million citizens of Donetsk and Lugansk regions will depend on this document. And why the ministry doesn't know about it and why the administration of the president is uh, uh, separated from governmental structures and this sort of uh, secret document or confidential document opens up many interesting issues for us, how decisions are approved in this country, how they correspond to the democratic procedure of transparency. I'm sorry. I absolutely disagree with that. What confidential document? It's not the document, but the whole country is talking about that. Uh, second, we have different branches of power. We have different subjects of legislative initiative. One of them is the president of Ukraine. The Council of Security and Defense uh, is the body which is subordinate to the president, and it's normal then this, that the structure which has the right for legislative initiative is using this initiative and they're developing their draft document. Why have not they invited our ministry as consultants? It's another thing. But um, there's no um, antagonism between the presidential administration and cabinet of ministers. When the time comes, we will be involved into that. Officially, the cabinet of ministers has to provide its uh, uh, also analysis of the document. And I would like to answer the question of uh, Madam Bielica and to answer the discussion that we have. And I would like to mention the issue of temporary uh, occupied territories. With the Crimea, we defined that that's annexation, and after that, the position of the international organization started to uh, get radicalized. In the first document, they were talking about territorial integrity of Ukraine, and they did not mention Crimea at all. If we recognize that as temporary occupied territories, that doesn't mean that we refuse from these territories. We are just working on reintegration in this context. Talking about the draft law, the discussion is going on. Everyone was providing comments. First, there was a concept that was not made public, but that was uh, stated uh, by different actors that there are two key things there. First, that this will not be ATO. This will be a military operation, and this will give legal grounds for proper actions of Ukrainian army. And second, that the territories will be recognized as temporarily occupied now. Tell me why Poroshenko and the authorities are criticized. They're criticized because for three years, they are calling it ATO. We understand it's not ATO and that this is rec not recognized as temporary occupied territories. There is a criticism in the society and the result of the survey confirms that if now, and we know that these two provisions are in the concept of the draft law, if now the authorities, because of some reasons, Either there will be the pressure of international partners on, because of other reasons, if they start to play back and these provisions are not included into the final draft of the law, this will be bad for the image of the authorities. And as to transparency, yes, this needs to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh we are uh, approaching the end of our briefing. I believe that we are going to meet next Thursday, uh, and, then, and our topic will be dedicated to decentralization. Thank you, and goodbye.